We will get underway. I'll call this meeting back to order. Welcome our guests, um, Lisa and... I'm Randy McPhillips. I'm the Manager of Recreation Services with the City of Brooks. Thank you, Randy. Um, we'll do a quick round of introductions, just in case there's somebody here that you don't know. I think Lisa know, probably knows everybody, but um, we'll in start with you, Neil. I'm Neil Johnson, Division 10. Amanda Philpott, Division 8. Hello, Ellen Unra, and I represent the countryside around the village of Rosemary. Hi, Greg Schrieber, Division 5, Aligno Resort and Castles. And I'm Kelly Chrisman, and I'm from the west side of the county, Div 6. Welcome. Hi, I'm Holly Johnson, Division 4, Scandia, Rainier and Bow City. Hello, Alina Skandrup, Division 2, Tilly and Area. Hi, Dan Short, Division 1, Rolling Hills. Hi, I'm Lynette Kopp, Division 3, Patricia Millicent Area. Hello, Arianna Nielsen, Executive Assistant. Sandra Stanway, Brooks Bulletin. I've had lots of interaction with them before. Okay, and, and you know Maria and Lisa, can I introduce you to Jeff? Jeff, Lisa? <laughs> Welcome, ladies. Um, I just want to start by saying that um, Reeve Dirksen um, is had to spin out um, for the afternoon, so um, I'm here in his place uh, to chair the rest of this meeting. So welcome. Um, take it away. Hey, well, thank you for having us. Um, the Joint Services Committee has recently discussed the concept of hosting the Alberta 55 plus summer games in 2023. And as a group, they decided to submit a regional bid. So prior to submitting this bid package, which is due June 30th, uh, staff is seeking some formal support for the event in a couple of ways. The first is an official letter of support from the County of Newell, which um, in discussions with county staff, we uh, are pretty confident that we already have a motion. And the second part is a commitment to provide funding for the event. The event would be held in late August of 2023, and it would be a qualifying event for the Canada 55 plus summer games. For the Alberta 55 plus games, they estimate approximately 750 athletes to participate. It's going to be held over four days and the economic impact is suggested at $650,000. If our regional bid for the 2023 games is not successful, then we can also um, make a shot for the 2025 event. So just a little background on Alberta 55 plus. So they are a nonprofit volunteer driven um, organization and their goal is to help mature Albertans enjoy a healthy vital future through active lifestyle choices. So these games are a multi-sport event that provide the opportunity for Albertans aged 55 and over to compete in a variety of sports and recreation activities. These are qualifying games, so they do bring in athletes and participants from eight zones across the province, and they qualify through their zone trials before they can compete at these games. And then those who qualify at the provincial games can actually go on to compete at the national level at the Canada 55 plus games. So there are 15 core sports that are part of these games, and those are outlined in the, in the table in the package um, that was provided to you. If you are select, or if we were selected, our plan would be to hold events throughout the region to showcase the rural areas and as well as um, facilities in the city and, and county. Uh, so that table also provides some of the suggested facilities for each of the core sports. These are just proposed locations at this time, um, essentially so we could demonstrate to the Alberta 55 plus uh, board that we have the ability to host the games in the region, that we do have the facilities to support this. Uh, there will almost certainly be changes to the locations and the venues and are certainly open to feedback and suggestions on where certain events are held. Um, there's also a social and uh, cultural aspect of the game, so there will be opening and closing ceremonies, um, cultural activities, and some evening social events. Um, and between hosting the sports in regional locations, using regional campgrounds, and then incorporating some of these social and cultural events, we hope to highlight all areas of the region. 
part of the process for bidding on the event of like Lisa had mentioned is to gain municipal support, which is why we're here. And if awarded, the next steps would be creating an organizing committee to look after the planning and logistics of the event and a draft budget for the games is also attached to the package you were provided. So we'll be speaking with municipal councils over the next couple of weeks before our bid package is complete and has to be handed in on June 30th. So at this time, we're requesting a budget commitment from each of our partner municipalities. We don't need the cash immediately, um, and we're just looking for the commitment so that if we are awarded the game, that the funding would be available for 2023. Uh, the uh, attachments that we've attached, if you have any questions on them, uh, please let us know. We're here to fill in the blanks. Good, thank you. Holly. <clears throat> So I have some questions about the fees and what people get from them. I haven't been involved, so I don't know if $65 is, is a standard kind of fee. But um, if they're getting $10 a participant a day for food, that's $40 credit plus a full banquet and being driven around. We're in a losing position here. Is that typical for how costs work? So it largely depends on the game structure. These ones do require the, the lunch um, provided to the athletes, keeping in mind that not all of the events would run the four days. Um, some athletes might only be in the area for one or two days, depending on the schedule of events and what they're competing in. Um, so that wouldn't be necessarily 750 athletes times four lunches times four days, if that makes sense. Um, but yes, that is, that's where the fees come from, the $65 fees. Then the budget's also supported by the, the municipal contributions, as well as sponsorship and any fundraising that we can do. Right now, our budget is uh, to provide two lunches per participant as well. Um, we like to estimate that the first day would be more of a travel day as well the final day. It will likely be the concentration of events across two days. So for four of the participants who are providing four lunches, we'll be providing two. Is, is the $65 though in line with what has been expected? That's actually the fee that's set by the Alberta 55 plus board. Yeah. <laughs> Ellen, please. <laughs> this line I've heard all day. Is that so, a picture moment or what? <laughs> so the banquet with full dinner, entertainment and decor, um, $40,000. Is that a prerequisite as well for, because I just came, went to a, a conference and our registration fee was significantly higher. And um, just the banquet alone with entertainment and decorations was $140 a piece. So the $65 registration fee seems pretty mi minor. Yeah, I think we, have, we do have some flexibility there. There is an expectation that there's an opening ceremony and a closing ceremony, uh, but what it entails is completely up to the host municipality or the host communities. So um, if we do want to scale back a little bit, I think that we would, we would be able to. And we've partnered um, with the city of Brooks for sure in the past, right? What games was that? Yeah, that's correct. It was uh, 2017. We hosted the Southern Alberta Summer Games. Um, and I believe there was also county support in 2010 when the Southern Alberta Summer Games were here as, as well. That was before I worked for the city, but right. I believe there was county support. And I remember in 2017, or 2010, I'm sorry, it had a regional component to it at that time, for sure. Um, and is our agreement, if, the, if this was to make money somehow, um, it would be shared or it would be given to charity or how, how do you deal with that? Because that should be written up somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah, it should. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're the first municipality we've presented to, so I'll make a note to add that somewhere. Yeah. Um, I believe in the past what we've done is we would just reduce the required municipal contribution. Sure. So with the 2017 um, Southern Alberta Summer Games, there was a municipal contribution that was requested um, to a maximum of, and then we didn't actually end up requiring that full amount. So we could do that. That is one option. Another option um, that we could look at is 
creating a legacy project moving forward. If we needed, you know, the horseshoe pits upgraded or a shuffleboard court put in or something like that. And an, and an additional option would be a charitable donation to a local group. Sure. Yeah. And then my other question is, <clears throat> what is the ask today? Um, I think Lane, you have written up a suggestion here in our RFD. Correct. It's $35,000 is the financial commitment that would be requested. And is that shared between five or how is that working? <laughs> so the total municipal contribution that we're um, having our budget is for $100,000. We're requesting 35,000 from the city, 35,000 from the county and 10,000 each from Bazano, Duchess and Rosemary. And it's probably detailed here and I just didn't see it, but it is. Okay, thank you. All right, um, council, how would you, <clears throat> yes, Amanda. I just thought it would be kind of neat to see any monies that were left over that could be donated to the handy bus or that, that's senior driven. Yeah. Just hmm. keeping in mind that we have two handy buses. There's one in the city and one in the county. Yep, that's any other, Holly. Well, I just wanted to note that I'm looking at what areas you're looking at having the events in and you want municipal support. But I'm noticing listing resources, you've missed two schools and three community halls. So um, I think if you want the community, the county to be involved, it would be good if you really look at all the resources of the county to like, try to see how you can include the county fully. So that's my suggestion. Yes, for sure. So like we said, that we're open to suggestions and, and certainly would love that feedback from, from county members. If, if we miss something and there's a facility out in the region that could be utilized and that would allow people to go out there, we would definitely add that in there. You missed all three halls in the school in my division, so it's a little personal. <laughs> okay. Council, decision makers. Neil, what's your... I'd, I'd make a motion that Lane worded there that we donate to 35,000. <laughs> Thank you. So it's a good cause mm -hmm. for all those old people. Yep. Thank you. The words um, mature, Neil, mature. I resemble that. Um, is there any more valid comments? <laughs> Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor of Neil's motion. And that is carried. Oh. Yeah. Thank you so much, ladies. Um, we're, well, one of us is a little giddy. I don't know what was in that lasagna for lunch, but <laughs> um, thank you for coming in and um, sharing that information. Well, uh, do you want to? That's what I was looking at. Yeah. Fresh in your minds, 8.1. Bylaw 20, uh, we're waiting for, do we need, oh no, Maria's here. Mm -hmm. 8.1, Maria. Yes, go ahead, Sam. Before we, uh, before we make a decision on that, could it be possible to get all of the permitted and discretionary uses read out for the current? Um, so the first one, Dan, just. So if we, yeah, but for for that, yeah, for the change for the third one, twenty thirty five, I think it is. Yeah, before we vote on that one, could we get the permitted uses and discretionary uses read out as current, and then what it would be, just so that it's very easy to understand before we make that vote. Okay, sure. But we're dealing with eight point one to start with, right? Okay, Holly. I motion that we um, could that yet. Let's Second intro. Reading. Let's let Maria intro it. Okay, and then our public viewing knows what we're talking about. Okay, go ahead, Maria. Thank you. Um, so this is bylaw 2033-22. Um, the purpose of the application is to redesignate re uh, a portion of the Northeast of 2817-12 from Agriculture General District to Industrial General District to allow for a power generation and data center operation. 
um, it is recommended by administration that second reading be given to this bylaw um, and third reading be tabled for the June 23rd meeting, the last meeting in June. Thanks. Okay, Holly. I would like to move second reading on bylaw 2033-22. Any further conversation? Call the question. All in favor of the motion. That is carried. 8.2203422, Maria. I'm just going to quickly bring up the land use bylaw. If that's sure. Okay. Yep. This is the one where you wanted the clarification, Dan? Yeah, this is the first one. This is the first one, yeah. Just adding some <laughs> storage to them. Yeah, no, the, oh. this, this one, I'm, I'm, I think it's, is understandable. It's okay. the next one I... Can you, 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 I gotta have a red back to be honest. <laughs> Maria I, will introduce it. Well, this is, I don't know, this is a tough decision. I wanna totally understand it. All right. We'll uh, let Maria introduce it, okay? Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, this is uh, bylaw 2034-22. So the purpose of this bylaw is to update this business hamlet district of our land use bylaw to include self-storage as a discretionary use within all, within the business hamlet district of the land use bylaw. So it's relevant to any parcel that is zoned business hamlet within the entirety of the county. Um, the purpose of the business hamlet district is to provide commercial and light industrial development within hamlets to serve local residents and the surrounding rural community. Um, adding the use as a discretionary as discretionary means that the use may be permitted in the district at the discretion of the development authority with or without conditions. Um, so the decision by municipal planning commission can be based on the specific permit for the specific parcel of land. Um, self storage is currently a discretionary use in business rural district and industrial general district of our land use bylaw. Self storage would be a reason would be a reasonable addition to the business hamlet district, um, given the nature of the current permitted and discretionary uses that are listed. Um, it is recommended by staff that second and third reading be given to bylaw 2034 22. Thank you, Maria. <clears throat> Are there any questions for Maria? Yes. Ellen. So when we speak of outdoor storage, that would include um, self-contained and outdoor? I do have a definition for um, self-storage that is currently in our land use bylaw. It is an outdoor area that may contain a building or structure used for the accessory keeping of goods, inventory, material, machinery, equipment, or recreational vehicles outside in association with the primary use of the parcel. So it could be used for outdoor or indoor storage, depending on the location and um, the application that is presented to MPC at that time. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, oh, I looked at Greg and said, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead, Neil. Is you okay? <laughs> I, I think there was something in that. <laughs> Go ahead. Why wouldn't all those uses be discretionary in Hamlets? Like to have, I know it streamlines and makes your job easier. But that, that's quite a varied list. Uh, I don't know. It, I think this kind of thing that's happening today is going to keep coming at us with that type of list. 
So you're you're wanting more lists to go to the permitted side more? No, I think they should. All, I think they should all be on discretionary side. Oh, oh, wow. Sorry, Matt. So that is that is taking away our staff position. Just oh, you can speak to this, Maria. This is your job. <laughs> The, the uses that are on this list are, are um, uh, decided on by council. So if you would like to change it, it's definitely an opportunity. Permitted uses are used by right. Um, and so those can be established at any point provided that they follow the um, policy within the land use bylaw. Discretionary uses can, um, it is a decision of MPC. So it, provided that it is suitable for that parcel, then it, it could potentially happen. Um, when we updated this land use bylaw, the intention was to reduce red tape, make it easier for development. Um, if a use is listed in the permitted use, it would be relatively quick and inexpensive, I suppose, to get a development permit for that. So um, it, it does create confidence in, in development or for developers when it when that list is when there is uses that are permitted on that on a property. That answers your question. That's exactly what I thought you were going to say and I understand it 100%. But in these little hamlets, is there any way I think they should be an exception. Because the problem that we're having today is that the guy scooted in under permitted uses. And really, you've got 80 people out there that don't want anything to do with this thing. So I think we should have maybe have a little bit more control only in the hamlets, like countywide, reduce red tape, get business coming in, get this going on. But it's just a thought. Like um, when I read down that list, none of them are really going to end up out at Lake Noel Resort in that area. And if the storage hadn't been, oh, I'm not sure even sure how to word it. I just, I think we need more discretion on these kind of things, not wide open, only in the hamlets. Just a thought. Um, Adina. So I, I just want to say, I think the Lake Noel Resort hamlet is um, is is different than the rest of the hamlets. Uh, I was thinking about it at lunchtime. You know, the village, the hamlet of Tilly would welcome a lot of these things that are on the list. Lake Newell Resort is special, I think, compared to the other hamlets in the county of Newell. So I wouldn't want to restrict them simply because we've got 80 people from from Lake Newell Resort that are, are not in agreement with it. I, I agree with that 100%. But if we had everything on discretionary, give it all to Tilly. Like, I agree with everything you said. But this one out here is a special case. And it, it doesn't fit this. So you're not in favor of reducing red tape? You're in, you're in favor in everywhere, of increasing red tape? I'm in favor of reducing it everywhere except Lake No Resort. Dan, and then Lynette. That's what I was going to say is this is not about Lake No Resort. This is about everywhere and we have to think about everywhere. The majority, not just one single place. Matt, you're up. Then Matt. Basically, Dan said what I was thinking. Um, like. <laughs> I think most places, to what Adina said as well, would welcome having a business come in. Um, and Lake Newell Resort is just a little different setup, and it is what it is. Thank you. Matt? Yeah, I just wanted to anchor back to what we're deciding on here today related to the business, the Hamlet Business District is adding self storage as a discretionary use. So I think. One of, the, one of the things we want to position, position ourselves for as a county is certainty for our developers, right? So if I'm a developer and I buy a lot that is zoned business Hamlet district, I know right off the hop what I can just come in and do 
based on that permitted use list. So if I'm a developer, I want to see more on the permitted use side of the page. Discretionary, I can buy that lot, but now it's a gamble that I have to come in front of council and get the development permit here. And you might put conditions on me. It's not, not as certain, right? So if we're looking to grow and attract development, I think we want to be mindful of really like these, these columns and the, the uses where they show up really matter. Uh, and Maria can uh, speak more intel intelligently about why something would get onto the discretionary side, but it's typically things that uh, could cause some detriment to neighboring property owners. Greg. I agree 100%, Matt, in that um, although Lake Newell Resort is unique, um, I think um, it is unique because it has been treated differently uh, than the other hamlets. We're not really that much different because uh, in my feeling, it's important to have economic development, especially out at the ha out, out at Lake Newell Resort. And I, and I think this to be, uh, to cut down on red tape and have this as a hamlet, uh, with all the hamlets in the county uh, uh, grouped into this, into this bylaw, I think it. I think it's important, and Matt said it correctly in that we don't want to hamper economic development. We want to promote it, and our council's our council is is on that, and we've got a a real good opportunity out there at Lake New Resort, and I don't think it should be treated any differently. To tell you the truth. I think it should be, I think it should, uh, economic development should happen out there. And um, I'm, I'm voting for this to add the, the self storage on the motion. I'm going to make the motion that we um, go with the uh, putting the self storage on the discretionary use. Um, no, our motion is second reading to bylaw 2033 dash 2. That is the one I want to do. So I'll, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> Oh, I'd like to uh, um, put that through. Are there any other questions, comments? Yeah. Just to getting back to um, Neil's point about, for example, vehicle services. So that would be discretionary use in all our hamlets. So if someone wants to open up a repair shop for a car business or uh, tires, that sort of thing, that would be a that would be a permitted use then, right? And, and we can't set any, for example, conditions on it that yes, use yes, tires not yes, in a permitted can. use. Can we do that? Oh, we wouldn't. We wouldn't see the permitted. No, our our um, our bylaw is at second reading, right? You didn't raise any of these concerns at first reading. But there's a reason why there is second and third reading, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Can somebody answer, please, Ellen's question? Um, the uses that are on the permitted use list are a use by right. So provided that they meet the policy of the land use bylaw, then it would not have to be a decision of the Municipal Planning Commission. It would be um, administrative. Um, it, it would be approved administratively. Any other questions, comments? Just one. Yes. Yes. How often, Neil? Do you review the permitted uses and discretionary uses? Like this isn't carved in stone forever. Maria, go ahead. <laughs> This is something that we'd like to look at fairly regularly um, and propose amendments um, as we use it and we, we flag different things. Um, so it's something that we would like to amend um, on a fairly regular basis. So any concerns that may arise, um, we're happy to add them to the list and, and present them to Council um, when we're able. Ready for the question? All in favor of Greg's motion. A 
Opposed? That is carried. Would you like to do third reading as well? Please. Go ahead. Um, third, I, um, administration would suggest that third reading um, for bylaw 2034-22 is also heard at this meeting mm -hmm. if council wishes. Anybody? Dan? Can we just go straight to that motion or do yeah. we have to waive anything? No, nope, we okay. can go with Then you. I'll make the motion for third reading on that bylaw. Okay. Any further conversation? All in favor of the motion? Opposed? That's carried. We are down in the row here. Let's go to 13. 13.1 payment. Oh, yes, 203522. Thank you. Let's stay there. I clicked it off. Thank you. We can't miss this one. No. <laughs> um, the purpose of this application is to redesignate um, Plan 0514207, Block 5, Lot 26, um, in the hamlet of Lake Newell Resort from Special Parks and Public Service District to Business Hamlet District to allow for the development of a self storage business. I will, um, well, should I start with the existing uses? Um, so it is currently zoned, sorry, I'm not sure why I can't bring it up. <laughs> okay, it is currently zoned special parks and public service. So the permitted uses on the parcel as it is currently include accessory buildings and structures less than 190 square meters, government services, park, school, and utilities. Discretionary uses include accessory buildings or structures that are over 190 square meters, exhibition grounds, boat launch, campground, recreation, indoor and outdoor, shipping container, and freestanding and wall-mounted solar panels. The uses um, should council wish to amend the land use district of this specific parcel at Lake Newell Resort, um, include the follow. Oh, sorry. Would you like me to read these out? Or, yeah, read them? No? Okay. Okay. And then also included in this list would be self storage as a discretionary use. Uh, it is based on the policy that is in the area structure plan of the Lake Newell Reservoir Resort area. It is recommended by council, or pardon me, by administration that second and third reading be given to bylaw 2035-22 to redesignate this specific parcel from special parks and public service district to business hamlet district. Thank you. Comments, questions, Holly. Okay, just trying to get this in my head. So the area structure plan in 2007 or 2003 designated as, a, as basically a business lot is basically what it was saying. And at some point, because of county bylaws, it got put into parks, but the original designation was for a business type lot. Is that correct? Can I say that? Go ahead, Maria. Um, the area structure plan had a vision for that lot being RV storage. So the zoning was never changed to accommodate that RV storage at the time. Um, but the vision was for that to happen. So now that we're at the point of development, now all the steps need to be taken in order to make that available to the, to the developer. Um, so it's not uncommon. It's actually very common for when a developer comes in that a land use amendment is um, required and then the development permit. It's part of the process to stay in line with the area structure plan.
Neil. Yeah, that's a good question, Mike. When he bought this, it was zoned as special parks, right? And I have a little problem with that. Like, uh, he knew that it was special parks. And he put his hand up and bought it. But the Ritchie Brothers ad said specifically that it was RV storage. Well, so that's what he was looking at. Looking at, okay, well, that's what it says. So it's how deep you expect a buyer to go, I guess, is the question, right? Well, that's why I'm a little concerned with this. It, was Ritchie Brothers out of line there? With, like, as far as not getting information goes, our buyer maybe didn't do his due diligence quite as well, quite well enough. It's also um, a discretionary use yep. as spe under special parks. So, so that means that he can come in and, yeah, so it's, still, mean, a, it's still a possibility. It's a possibility, but it wasn't cut and dried. When he nope. bought this, it was parks. It was a park. Well, with a chance of it with becoming shipping something containers, else. that's not a park. Shipping containers is on the uh, permitted use side. Oh, it was on discretionary side? Okay. I wrote it in the wrong spot. That's why I'm, why I'm wasting all this time on this. I, th I think it was messed up right at the auction, to tell you the truth. And I think we're doing the wrong thing by not supporting all the people out at Lake Norman Resort. They have a good point. That's, that's all I have to say about it. I need, to, I need that clarification. Thank you. Um, I think that's irrelevant to our discussion uh, and, and to our decision making process. Uh, it really has nothing to do. He's asking us if we will allow him to change the zoning from what's on that screen right now to what would be in business Hamlet. We know what his plan is, but again, that's going to be a discretionary use and we can deal with that at the time. That's not what we're dealing with. He wants the change to be allowed to ask to do these things. Are we willing to let him to ask to do that? That's, that's really what we need to be focused on. We know how the, how the residents feel quite clearly, but this is what he's asking for. He's a, he's a rate payer like everybody else, a property owner, and he wants to change his zone from one to the other, which aligns with the area structure plan. And that's what he's asking us to do. Forget about how we bought the land and all that stuff. That's irrelevant. I mean, that, that's, your, that's your heart. Don't think with the heart logically with 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 the bylaws he's asking us for quick permission for that we'll deal with what he asked for afterwards thank you lynette um two things um what could the utilities possibly be and when administration came with this bylaw change what's your reasoning for that to be changed just to state it right up um, utilities would be um, electrical services or if um, municipal services needed to, to put a water something in there, then that would be what utilities are. It's usually a, a government or, or some sort of service like that. So it could be a pumping station. It could be a building with a pump in it. Yeah. Um, and then... My, why my recommendation is, is that, so based, based on the policy of the area structure plan um, that was adopted by council, I, it, that is why the recommendation is what it is. I think um, developers use the area structure plan um, or they create the area structure plan to um, have some certainty to what can be developed in the future. Um, and it also goes through the public hearing process. It goes through three readings of council. All the adjacent landowners are notified um, when that is adopted. Um, when we get to this stage now to um, allow a development that is in the area structure plan to happen because there has been so much time, I do think that it is important to engage the public again, hear their concerns. Um, but there has to be very, very valid planning concerns in order, I believe, in order for council to um, make their decision. 
If I can, counsel, just take you back to Muni's 101. We all saw this chart in, in our um, workbook. Um, and it shows um, the area structure plan in gray is side by side with the area redevelopment plan. And it's underneath the land use bylaw. So this is the hierarchy of the Municipal Government Act. So I just want to remind you that the area structure plan takes place, takes precedence over the land use bylaw. Holly. Could you please put up again the um, parks one, what's allowed under there? Thank you. Oh, gotcha. That's not that different in many ways. Once again, I'm Adina. I'm ready to make a motion. We have a motion on the floor. Yeah, Greg made a motion for second reading. Oh, okay. Um, or was that no, the last no. time? Okay, so you're ready for a motion. I make a motion that we give second reading to bylaw 2035-22. That would be second reading. Thank you. Whew. Um, any more discussion? Yes, Alan. Just briefly getting back to the fact that now in every hamlet, it is allowed to have a tire business, um, vehicle repair business without MPC be able to set some conditions. And that so, I oppose. So that's a different bylaw. This is a this is a new bylaw 2035. I know, but this this has uh, uses, permitted uses under that, and okay. it's not discretionary. Okay. Your point is made. Thank you. Dan. That's only permitted use in hamlets in zones that are already business hamlet. Whatever we decide here today has no bearing on that at all. That's already there and in place. This changes none of that. This is specific to one parcel. Yeah. So every other business hamlet that's been that way for however long, they can have a vehicle group that nothing's changed about that. This is one property. Okay. All right. Any further comments, clarifications, questions? Greg. Just one comment that uh, when we, if we decide to uh, change the bylaw under the second reading here that um, and we decide uh, uh, on the planning stage that uh, on the permitting stage not to go ahead with this or, or, and say no that's not a discretionary use we want to pursue right now on this parcel the owner has now the opportunity to resell that that land as a proper commercial piece of land with the uses he has a sellable product also so even though his heart is set on a, a storage place that's a discretionary use if we decide not that it's not he he's open opened up to be able to resell it at a much easier easier way and in a and in a way that he actually bought the the, the parcel because he did buy the parcel with the uh, structure plan as an RV storage. Thanks, Greg. Any other comments, questions? I'm going to call the question. And this is for um, second reading of bylaw 2035 22. All in favor of Adina's motion. One, two, three, four, five. Opposed? That is carried. Narrowly, but it is carried. Five to four. All right. Now, can we go to 13? No? Oh, fourth reading. Gee. Ay, yay, yay. All right. 
Is there further discussion on 2035-22? This is not the comedy hour, you know. <laughs> uh, do I have a motion? Yes, Dan, thank you. Yeah, a motion we give third reading to bylaw 2035-22. Okay, any further comments? I'm gonna call the question, all in favor of the motion. Opposed? That's five to four, again, it's carried. Thirteen point one payment register. Are you up for something easy? Yeah. Information items. We actually don't have to go through them line by line. Um, strategic priorities. The RCMP reports are there. Let's do twelve post agenda items. Um, I'm going to start off with the weather one, and then if uh, Matt can be ready with the CDC one. Yes, Holly. I actually had a question about the payment registers. Was it for Matt? Okay. I just wanted to know, um, there was 140000 for a water tender for Duchess, and then 326000 for a fire engine. Is it typical we're buying two pieces of fire apparatus in the same year? I thought it was oh, yeah. tend to be more spread out, or what's the scoop on that? Yeah, those would have been included in the uh, the budget. And there are some years where you'll see multiple apparatus uh, purchased. Yep. Okay, so I asked for weather to be added. Um, the topic of weather and conditions is forefront of every conversation. Reference to a presentation at CPAA convention where it was said that climate change is real and these weather events will continue to manifest and intensify. Now, whether you believe in climate change or not, that's what the presenter presented. This past weekend's weather around Lomond or yesterday's declaration of local state of emergency by Sapers County highlights this. Um, this comment is from Alberta Environment website. Being prepared means you know what to do, where to go, and you have supplies to properly respond to emergencies and disasters. By taking simple steps towards becoming more prepared, you can better navigate disruptions when they occur so you can get back to your life and work sooner. When we are prepared to take care of our needs for a minimum of 72 hours, it allows first responders and all levels of government to focus on managing the crisis and helping those who need it most. That's a quote from the front page of Alberta Environment. My question for staff is, are we encouraging residents to prepare for weather, i.e. a tornado, heat? We saw heat last summer. Um, those would be the most obvious during summer. Alberta Environment and Alberta Can Environment Canada, sorry, have resources, but not all people have access to the internet. Do we have capacity or uh, a plan of how to inform residents of the plan? For example, in the case of extreme heat, do Div 6 residents know they can make their way to the community hall for safety? That's my question. That's an excellent question. I think in terms of communicating about emergency and emergency preparedness, that's an ongoing conversation. I know the province and the federal government do a lot to uh, promote, uh, you know, having your 72 hour kit, having a, an emergency evacuation plan is a common theme that uh, comes out during fire prevention week from, from Stuart, but there's always an opportunity to amplify the message. And if that's a direction that council would like to go, you know, we do have airtime with the, the local radio station and that could be a positive message to, uh, to amplify for people. Um, in terms of emergency response plans and where each individual resident would go to, that would be a, a good question and getting those details out. Uh, that could be something that we look to, uh, to Stuart for and uh, 
give some information back to council. Good deal. Thank you. I, I, it's a passion of mine, emergency planning. So um, anything I can do to help, I'd be happy to do that. And summer's coming on. I would hate for some person to be stuck out in the farmhouse and die of heat exhaustion. Neil. Yeah, that's a, what you brought up is important right across the country. At FCM, there was a climate change preparedness workshop and like Bruderheim has one and there's they they selected five communities around the country that have already got their plans in place but it's it's the wave of the future I think we should at least be aware of it and and talk and move about on it, it and make yeah. some plans you bet climate change might be real listen to them and for sure it is like they had some pretty interesting stats Lynette mm -hmm. I went to the same climate change uh, workshop that he went to. There's a website that you can go to. It's called climateatlas.ca, and it gives you um, predictions as to what the temperatures are going to be going forward. And one of the, the quotes from the speaker in that series was, warmer, wetter, and wilder is what we're going to end up with as we go forward. And a lot of our rural residents don't have air conditioning, so do they know the community hall in their closest hamlet or town or village has air conditioning? Yeah, Ellen. Good point, Kelly, because I hear that uh, around a thousand people died in BC last year during that heat uh, oh. spell. Around a thousand, I believe. Seriously? Yes. So, did not know that. <laughs> Dan. I think there's there's two different things. There's there's an emergency response planning that needs to be done, which I'm sure is already done, and then there's just a, a public information that needs to be put out there when we get close to situations like that. If the forecast is for plus 35, plus 40, plus 45, maybe then we need to get on some public information to tell people, hey, we have this in this place, we have that. Those are the kind of things I think you need to be talking about doing now rather than waiting for an emergency. Um, so, I, yeah, it's just basically some steps to take before it gets to an emergency. Yeah, is, it's is the important part. Yeah, Holly. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I'm, I think you see the weather alerts they put out when they put out blizzard warnings and cold warnings. They never would have done that 30 years ago. Everybody just knew that you prepare for weather. We've kind of lost the preparedness piece in our easy world. So, I, I would agree. And my son took a picture of funnel cloud from our farm the other night. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's real. Yeah. I think one thing that uh, people out at the resort are concerned about is there, there's really only one access into Lake New Resort and a pretty crummy second access, uh, a second exit over top of a, a EID canal. So um, fire is real. If someone were to throw a cigarette butt out at Highway 36, that can come across that prairie pretty quickly and cause, cause some uh pretty quick response that needs to get out and we don't have that preparedness out at the resort at all. So it's just something in the future to think about. I also want us to think about the people that don't have internet access. So let's use our, our libraries, our public buildings to tell people, whether it's through posters or whatever, because not everybody has internet. And some people still appreciate opening up the newspaper. And it's now free in every mailbox in the county. I don't know what, what happens in the city, but in the county, it goes to every mailbox. So, Holly. Some of the Mennonite ladies in my community have said they look at the, the poster board in the post office. That That is their... That's their news. Their news. Mm -hmm. So that's the place you need to focus on as well mm -hmm. as just getting it out there. Posters. Posters. I know for some people it's archaic, but it's not for everyone. Not No, not in our small communities. We all have those communities community bulletin boards or those coffee shops or tell it to a man at the coffee table, it'll spread. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, <laughs> that was uh, just a little comedy hour then. Um, so uh, we're up to CDC update. Um, Matt will take us through that. Sure. So uh, Reeve Dirksen happened to bump into the Minister of 
agriculture on last weekend and landed a quick impromptu meeting with him in Edmonton and the uh, deputy minister Shannon Marchand was there and a few support staff. So we were able to uh, inquire and it was really, you know, framed as an exp exploratory meeting. So what plans, if any, does the province have for the CDC South? We see that as a an underutilized asset and we'd like to see it optimized. So what what's in motion? Uh, and they do have some tire kickers, some applied research associations. They, they wouldn't name them currently uh, that are inquiring and interested. There are some test plots that are currently being used by the, the U of L or private researchers. So that, that was encouraging to hear that there is some use being made of it. Uh, the ministry has a plan over the next uh, few months or so to uh, they're doing a project looking into applied research associations and what the potential uh, for partnerships can be there. Uh, they also have on their work plan to get down to the site and inventory all of the assets that they have there. We took up our, uh, uh, our detailed assessment sheets, which gives them an indication of what buildings are out there and what they're valued at. Uh, you know, there's been a really significant investment by the province in that place, and it's really been underutilized for a decade or so. Uh, we have local talent and expertise in the research and development side of things. Uh, the province has kind of removed itself from the research and extension activities. So uh, a plan is in motion. Uh, I see today I've got an email back from the assistant deputy minister looking to uh, make contact and says they're happy to, to describe in more detail what the vision is. So things are starting to roll on that CDC South conversation and we'll uh, keep council updated as things move forward there. Any questions for Matt? Yeah, great. I think that uh, CDC is very important. I think it's been forgotten by by government uh, over the years and it's the importance of uh, protection of food and uh, food production is very important and i think i think it's going to become on the forefront uh, moving forward um, i know the lethbridge um, research area that's all federal so this is something that the provincial government uh, can actually hang its hat on if they want to so mm -hmm. Um, so I have an idea for our community um, event, and I know it's not on the agenda, but I'm just going to throw it out there. It's come to my attention that the museum will not be hosting their annual Canada Day breakfast. So there's a hole in the community that's a possibility. It's an opening. Um, maybe we invite people out to our parking lot and host a Canada Day breakfast this year. That's what I had envisioned when I put that up there was just one spot, not six or 10 around the county, that we invite the county res ratepayers and residents to the county, to this magnificent facility. Um, so I'm just gonna plant that seed and see what staff does if they if they want what do you think you don't like it well it's interesting because when we talked about the idea in Canmore I thought great idea right you start asking rate peers and they're like why would you spend our tax dollars hosting an event they were kind of like um, I said like they held something central would you go to it well probably not like I just didn't I was surprised that the residents I talked to didn't really think that was something that was worth spending taxpayer dollars on so I was really in favor initially when the idea came up, but I don't see a lot of enthusiasm coming from my area, so. Dina, I think it's a very good idea. The only, only problem for me is, is that I'm already booked up on Canada Day because I'm part of the band and it's got a really busy day in Rosemary. Like we're in the parade and then we're doing a concert. So you would have to do it without me. 
and me as well. I'm on in the parade of the Rosemary Parade, plus I'm on the Egg Society, so I'm working that day too. Neil. Uh, I think it's a really good idea. Like we might be split like July 1st, like Rosemary's got their big deal, Brooks has got theirs, Zano's probably got something. No. No? Anyway, the ID, we had a farmer appreciation day. This is actually Holly was there when your kids was a baby. That one. Uh, that turned out really well. Like we got over a thousand people out to Lake Newell Resort. Uh, everybody wandered around. It was a really cool day. And all it was was a EID, you know, hamburgers, whatever, appreciation, come and meet your neighbors kind of thing. And it doesn't have to be July 1st. I think this one was okay. yep. August 1st or something like that. But. Okay. Well, Dan, and then Holly. I also think it's a great idea that way people can come out and wave their Canadian flags like they haven't had a chance to do lately. I was gonna, I was gonna say the reason people were came out so much is because there was something new to see. People always want something new. So if we're gonna do something here, there, there has to be something else. Just to come and have breakfast wouldn't okay. draw. I don't Good know what point. that would be, but there has to be, it's like the EID Park in Scandi. If you open a new building, people come. If it's just the same old, just, you know, been there, done that. Okay, well, that's good feedback for the staff. It's all good. Yes. Well, and I, I, I'm sorry, but I would push back on, I, I would not be going to staff. I would not be comfortable going to staff at all right now and saying, hey, you need to whip up a July Correct. 1st party. As you're also like, you've got staff who've got full-time jobs and they're in the middle of getting ready for committee of the whole meeting, budget planning meeting. You got people who are probably gonna be away July 1st. They haven't planned to be here and your barbecue is not available. So, I mean, we could probably find a, another barbecue, but if the intent is to use the county barbecue and, you know, have a plan for it, we should have a little more runway Lead to, Lead to pull it together. So we're, we're not entirely opposed to the idea, but I think if we're gonna do it, we wanna, do it right and make sure that uh, we've got staff and barbecues and all that stuff lined up. We know you got your uh, apron. Apron, so. <laughs> okay, two two twenty. Um, I think I covered the agenda. Anybody? Oh, Mark. Eleven point two in camera. Uh, just director's report. Oh. Yes, thank you. It's Sorry, okay. Mark. It's okay. I get it. <clears throat> well, it's it's buried in. We forget to grade roads too sometimes. Yeah. So it's okay, Council. I know your number. And dry them out. If you live on pavement, I guess you're safe until winter in a way. No, yeah. just kidding. Yeah. Uh, you have some statistics in front of you. I don't need to take too much of your time. We've moved into our summer uh, programs and whatnot thing top of mind right now is we finally got some rain mm -hmm. and instead of dust washboard and crappy roads we have muddy wet crappy roads and uh, we just need some time we really need the time we need some time for roads to dry out so our graders can get around we can regravel a few things that need the attention and roads will be back to where people expect them to be because we have been inundated with phone calls since monday so just so you all know if you haven't taken the heat we are <laughs> it's okay we're here we got it like just like we always do but just got to be mindful that we really didn't have much rain last year we de dealt with severe dry conditions last year and uh, all we heard about was washboard rough roads dust dry conditions and we get our first rain and I'm trying to be fair. I understand where rate pairs are coming from, but it was a day and a half, a little bit more of a slow, steady rain. Those types of rains soak into the roadbed and things get muddy. When you get the hard and fast, if you got an inch over 10, 20 minutes, most of it ends up in the roadside ditches and sheds. Um, th this one saturated in. So that's probably the most pressing thing we've been dealing with. And, and that's okay. Uh, onboarding of our new mechanic has taken place. So we, we have two full-time mechanics in the shop now. Prior to this time, we had a shop foreman that was doing the management side of things as well as mechanicking. 
Uh, we made that restructuring where Terry is now overseeing the shop as the uh, manager of operations, and we have two full-time mechanics. So that's getting us back to uh, our normal capacity of, of labor down there. And uh, they continue to meet having um, team meetings and, and developing along the, the lean principles and stuff down there. So um, grading, we already talked about truck drivers. They wrapped up the stockpile program May 13th. And um, that's where we've reduced some stockpiles by 30% this year, just due to the paving projects that have been undertaken in the past couple of years in partnership with Alberta Transportation. That's about 30% less than the Tilly stockpile this year, and we'll go direct from Seville Pit to, uh, to location. Uh, dust abatement program, June 15th, that's when it's going to happen, pending weather. <laughs> There's always that little catchphrase in there, pending weather. We do not do dust abatement uh, application when it's raining or when it's severely wet, so let's uh, pray for more wet weather, but not so much it delays or defers dust abatement, right? I don't control those things, so we just work around them. Uh, you can see the stats uh, through that. Uh, we, we had a few more applications than what we've had in the year in the past. Uh, obviously, some of that is because, again, we, we removed some of that of the 100% county paid program, and uh, we had a few more applications that way. Uh, what else we got here? Uh, county pathway, the first 2.4 kilometers, we're, we're close to having a design, design all complete with that and getting ready for tender. The Kinbrook Connection Pathway Partnership, the other 10 kilometers taking us to Kinbrook from Township Road 18.2. Uh, we are about the same stage on those things. Um, we did not receive our uh, CCRF grant, which was $750,000 we applied for. Um, the city did apply for the active transportation grant, I believe it is, which is valued up to $750,000 again. So we're hopeful, we're probably more hopeful on that one than what the CCRF was in a way, but uh, waiting to catch word on that. And with that, we're just kind of playing as to how we tender the projects because we must get the 2.4 kilometer done this year because the deadline on the province's funding is December 31st of 2022. Um, Jeff's been working on the uh, rural water phase two stuff. You already heard a little bit more about that today. And uh, he's also been busy with uh, preliminary design reports and, uh, and various things on paved roads. We're looking at guardrail, uh, sorry, not guardrail, but post and cable barrier currently at the aqueduct that should be a guardrail barrier. Working on that one. Rolling Hills truck parking lot, it's, it's being prepared for tender purposes. And uh, of course, Tilly Landfill Closure, he's working diligently now with uh, Journey Engineering on that matter. Also, uh, they were also a firm that was interested in the uh, pathway part, uh, projects. And crack sealing is underway. Following that, line painting. That's the order that that always happens in for your education component, because you don't paint the lines and then go and crack seal all the yellow line and cover it all up, right? Other than that, uh, a couple of you attended the Community Planning Association of Alberta conference with, uh, with Jeff there. Understand that was a good one. And uh, then I got the permit statistics where we're trending about 20% above where we were last year. So a um, little more activity out there in the uh, industry side of things and moving over dimensional overweight permits, stuff like that. That's about the status that I have for you, unless there's other questions. Adina. Two questions. Um, first of all, in my area, there the roads aren't bad except for where the neighbors pivot waters the road. Does is somebody monitoring that at all, or do we need to be reporting it? And second, just my second question is: Do you have a list for dust abatement? Where you're starting? Who's first? Who's last? Well, I didn't bring the rotation with me. It's done with two crews. There's a north crew and a south crew. And if I remember right, they're working in a clockwise con um, pattern. Division, how is he going? Five, two, five, two, one, four, and six. Uh, these go by operational numbers. Six, eight, seven, and three. No, not electoral divisions, operation divisions. Sorry to confuse you all. The second one is, 
Report your complaints and concerns. Most preferably if you use Newell Connect, I will keep berating you with Newell Connect. You phone Jolene, Jolene puts it into Newell Connect. Um, if you can enter it yourself, that would be appreciated. Or whoever is feeding you the complaint, you could ask them to put it in the Newell Connect. The more you use it, the better you'll get at it. Holly? Holly, if test abatement is starting June 15th, that's the first question, when is the ending date? Approximately, just, and we're supposed to get an inch of rain on Monday the 13th, should I tell you that? Um, and <laughs> And are, is it just Scandia that has a plethora of um, motorcycle quadding, motorbike complaints, or is that a, uh, because I get them all the time now, so I'm just wondering if it's just, just my area or what? Maybe it moved into your area. It seems to be a moving target. You get a handle on it here, and it shows up somewhere else. Um, two weeks dust abatement. We should be done before July 1st. Weather pending. Dan? My question was relating to that uh, road sprinkling. When we put it on Newell Connect, um, do you need to see it with the uh, sprinkler actually hitting the road or the wet spot where it was? <laughs> if matters are ever challenged, it's almost necessary for our community peace officers to witness it. Um, we are doing a little bit more investigation into this matter because our neighbors don't necessarily utilize the same bylaws or procedures that we do. So we may be bringing uh, something back to council for further direction or decision making on how we deal with this because um, it's not the easiest thing to deal with. The ones that are most concerning to us is when the end gun is literally spraying the road and it's moving the gravel off into the ditch. As for, yes, there's a lot of that. As for some of the other stuff, um, sometimes some of the hanging sprinklers don't shut off the way that they should. There's been wind blowing. There's kind of a plethora of things that need to be considered and courts really aren't too friendly with trying to ticket people on these things. Lynette, and then Ellen. So dust abatement. If you have gotten dust abatement for a couple of years and then you decide not to get it, um, grading, yes, no, why, if they don't think it needs to be. On the application, it says the county reserves the right to grade the road for the purposes of public safety and so on and so forth without being a verbatim regurgitation of things. But we do maintain roads for safety. I can respect and appreciate that some residents have gotten the subsidized rate where they have invested two thirds of the one third to cover their application. Some pay full price rate. Uh, yeah, you paid for it, but it's still a county road. We will always maintain it for safety. I am not going to say that we are always perfect, that the potholes were deep enough or the road was rough enough to not grade it up, but we do trust our grader operators to use their discretion because I am not and Terry are not running around to investigate before a grader operator grades it up. Thank you. Ellen. Just getting back to the tender for the county pathway, which obviously needs to be finished by a certain date uh, because we have the stimulus program, uh, monies, right, that we have to spend. But are we jumping the gun a little bit uh, for the Kinbrook connection pathway since we didn't receive the grant and we're not sure yet if, the, if Brooks has, is going to get it? Are we jumping the gun a little uh, with tendering that part already? How we tender is being considered. It may not all be tendered at the same time. It's under consideration. That was the plan from the beginning. So, yeah. I have some risk to manage okay. from the county's perspective on this matter as well as myself. Yeah. Okay. Because it's tough to put work out when you can't guarantee the work because something is going to be owed to somebody. Okay. So we are working with that and where we're 
headed and that's why we're still hopeful of the grants and the public contribution and those sorts of things coming in to make it happen but we are still working with it neil did you have a question i thought you did maybe no but um just a thought that doesn't uh i can't really recall exactly but it doesn't the idea have a water policy like the ditch riders monitor the or they're supposed to <laughs> okay what do you got to say that's great I like it. Um, that, that's some of the investigation that we need, need to do with irrigation pivots or wheel moves or even flood irrigation where it impacts roads. Um, some of our neighbors simply phone the irrigation district and expect it to be dealt with. Um, we have our own individual bylaw on that matter. And so we have been taking those tasks upon ourselves. And uh, I think we need to find a proper working relationship because if it is impacting a road, it should be, in my opinion, considered water waste. I just don't know how ambitious uh, we are in the region to deal with that. I know for sure that you can't uh... You can't flood irrigate and expect your neighbor to take your water, but everybody does it. We, we went through that conversation multiple times over there and uh, mm -hmm. I forget how they dealt with it. But. Yeah, and, and we the, the county is caught up in some of that discussion as well. And uh, I think we need to uh, have further discussion with the Eastern Irrigation District on that and, and come to a common understanding as to how we're going to deal with it in the future. Okay, so a motion or more questions? Just one last question over the um, preliminary design roads for paved roads for the Air Corps Road, that, those ones. So those roads were decided to be done by the previous council and we're just going to look at the tenders and then the next we'll be looking at the paving program ongoing. No? Just trying to understand how that works. Okay, if you're referring to the preliminary design reports, yeah. These are the paved roads that are already in place that have yes. pavement on them as to what kind of preservation strategy we need to have to move forward with them. So we don't ever, that is not considered part of the roads for paving. That's a whole nother, we talk about the paving. Is this, is this concluded under the paving budget or is this it, a separate budget? This will be under the paving budget because it is also the, the, the future the growth and development of paved roads for the network of the region, but it's also the preservation and maintenance of. Okay. Adina. All right, I just have one question about New Connect. Um, one photo sent in complaint is enough for somebody to investigate or does it need to be more and more and more? I'll be honest, it doesn't even need to be a photo, but the more information you can give us, the better so that we're not running around chasing ourselves around the block looking for the problem. Any other questions for Mark and his report? A motion to approve NRSC and Mark's report. Lynette, thank you. All in favor of the motion. Carried. Okay. Now can I adjourn? No? Okay. Well, I would like to hear something about the FCM conference. At, um, the a verbal or... report or do you want to wait for the written report? Oh, it wouldn't be a written report? Usually we get written reports, right? Well, we do either, either way, but usually we report at the last meeting in June. We, we just got back and we haven't had time yet. Yeah. But I, I can certainly... If the... No, recovering can from the Can you use trip. your microphone? Oh, not fair. <laughs> okay. Um, so reports next next meeting at the end of the month. Okay. All right. Um, I will adjourn this meeting then. Would somebody like to make a motion? Holly? No. Okay. I can just adjourn it. Thank you. Three twenty two thirty five.